resource to else wants it. And Karen, just to be clear, you didn't do it. We know who did it, Steve. We know. And we know who spearheaded this cover-up. You all know. Yes, we do. And no, she didn't do it. No, she didn't do it. This is an innocent woman. She didn't do it. I tried to save his life. Yeah. I tried to save his life at 6 in the morning. I was covered in his blood. I was the only one trying to save his life. Why'd you admit to it? He didn't, she didn't admit to it. She didn't admit to anything close to that. Nothing close to that. And you should know that. Sounds like three or four times she admitted to it. No, no she didn't. that's not true. She asked a question. It makes absolutely no sense. That is the Commonwealth grasping at straws. If it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's a duck. We have the eight letters. We've seen them. We've read them. We are using them. The genie cannot be put back in the bottle. Yeah, LTL true crime. We going deep in the dark. Yeah, yeah peeling back the layers, expose the hidden mark. Oh, yeah. From the streets to the alleys where the secrets lie. Get in into minds of the wicked, no alibi. LTL true crime unraveling the web of evil No stone left unturned, we diving to the pond Yeah, we digging up the dirt, bringing justice to the crime LTL true crime unveiling dark realities every time Yeah, LTL true crime, we going deep in the dark yeah. Peeling back the layers, exposed to him more from the streets to the alleys where the secrets lie Get it bring to mind something wicked, no alibi We gotta hit up, now we hit down here top Play the world in the books That's the actual care I go We don't get living the show But then I'm not talking, baby, they're the fool Put a good place in the world No damn to each other Put down to each other We gotta hit up, now we hit down here top Play the world in the books Hey, I pick down true crime Blue down with dark realities every time uh, This is Hey, I pick down true crime Blue down with dark realities every time Yeah, LTL true crime We going deep in the dark Yeah Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to LTL True Crime. We are live here on March. Oh, gosh. It's Wednesday, March 27, 2024. And if you could have just seen me and Melanie backstage, we're literally doing stretches before we're going on air. I know Melanie did a killer, like, over, I think it was like three-hour stream today. <laughs> went over the last hearing. She was reading. She said, I literally lost my voice. I said, don't worry. I'll do most of the talking today. Um, but it's great to have her back here. We're going to bring her in in a second. So uh, tonight what we have planned is we're going to go over the most recent hearing because I know there was a lot of confusion about that. And, and Melanie said that she'd be glad to take us through that. And then what I wanted to talk about also, and I dropped the video uh, a little earlier this afternoon about two sticking points in one of Karen Reed's hearings about three hearings ago when Alan Jackson got up and confirmed, confirmed that uh, the Google search in Jen McCabe's phone uh, via the FBI was confirmed, uh, 227 did happen, and that uh, Karen Reed, the injury to John O'Keefe, are not consistent with Karen Reed's SUV uh, hitting John. So I thought that was a good sticking point. We could talk about that. And then finally, to wrap up the show, uh, I did put together a presentation tonight and we'll ask the question, and I want to ask an attorney, uh, and that's why I brought Melanie on to talk about would Karen Reed have to take the stand? But I won't wait too long, uh, too much longer. Let's bring Melanie in and welcome back here to LTL True Crime. There's my buddy. How are you? 
We're just like back here, like, like oh! she was in the green room pressing. Uh, I'm great. How are you? I'm it's well. It's so nice to be able to sit back here. I don't have to be like near controls. I don't be manning any controls or anything. Are we allowed to say that anymore? Manning? Or is that like oh, a. God. Does it have to be? We, I'm personing the controls over here. Um, but it's nice personing. to relax. So <laughs> these are having me. Yeah, it's awesome to have you back. Um, yeah, so how's everything going? And what do you think of all this crazy? I guess there's now a motion that we're not allowed to protest outside the code and the court anymore. 500 feet, we need to stay away. Anybody that has free Karen Reed gear or is there to support Karen has to stay away. It's insane. It's well, insane. they're asking for that. I don't know if they're gonna, it's gonna be granted, but you know, how is that 500 even feet is a football field and a half, more than a football field and a half. So uh, nobody's allowed within that zone. That's what they want. And then nobody's allowed to wear any t-shirts or signs or no pets are allowed to wear any free Karen Reed or justice for John O'Keefe or anything, any logos. It's, uh, it, it's, it's whack. I, I don't know if the judge is going to grant it, but based on the way we've seen her ruling throughout this case, I mean, I don't know, just ask for everything and see if you can get it. I, and then they're like, Oh, and if you need help enforcing it, I'm sure the dead and police would step up and, you know, get out there and, police it 500 feet how about this how about th have the jurors come in the back door how about that yeah problem solved i mean don't they do that in usually most cases like they i mean yeah. they don't uh, raid know, the, the first, jury the, the first right? amendment is not alive and well in massachusetts i'm <laughs> from new york you know i am so like what are they doing to your freedom of speech over there you can't wear well, a t-shirt yeah, that's what I was saying. Like, you're going to bar people. So you're essentially saying that no one's going to be allowed to come in the courtroom only if they're they're supporting the Commonwealth. That doesn't make any sense to me. I've heard this, you know, I've, I, I covered another case in California that was a very devastating case about two little children that were like three and four years old that were tragically, uh, you know, unalive by their foster mm -hmm. parents, ad adoptive foster parents. Um, and the, the judge did make that ruling that nobody could come into the courtroom with t-shirts with the kids pictures on them you know and whatever and that's okay that's common but so that nobody outside the courthouse can wear and pick hold a sign or wear a shirt or a button um and they have to be 500 feet away when like the average restraining order is less than that for a domestic violence type situation <clears throat> so like make it make sense i i can't make it make sense i think it's crazy well but i think I think just a lot of it is that they, the Commonwealth knows their their story's falling apart. So they're going to try to get every angle and every edge that they can to to try to beat this back and you know keep keep the supporters away or the peaceful protesters away, um, you know, to make it look like they still have the authority, they still have the power going into this. I mean, they're losing every hearing. In my opinion, they are losing more and more. I was talking to you about this earlier. I just said. This is almost like an embarrassment that they're going to try to take this to try. Like they're pushing this and taking it to trial. Oh, well, have you not been on Twitter? Because the people on the other side of this seem to think that they are winning. That this, yeah. you know, this motion, to, I mean, that, that this was a huge win and that there's a whole, there's all kinds of theories about why Jackson didn't show up and why Yanetti didn't show up and why, you know, they're throwing Tannis Yanetti under the bus. Uh, listen, I put a crown on her in my thumbnail. I thought she was a queen yesterday at that hearing. So, I, I, are we watching the same thing? I don't know. I don't know, but let's take, do you want to take, we'll take a look at it. We'll, we'll go through. It's only about a 17 minute hearing. And a, a lot of people were confused. I'll be honest with you. When I was, when I was streaming it, I was a little lost as to what was going on. Um, I, and I asked you about this earlier uh, about the motion to dismiss. This had nothing to do with the motion to dismiss, right? Or yeah. Okay. No, because the motion to just there's so there's still two outstanding motions. There's the motion to dismiss the indictment based on the fact that they said defense said improper information was um uh, was shown to the grand jury and and admitted and that should not have been and therefore you should dismiss the indictments outright mm. because the grand jury was tainted because you gave them all misleading information. That was one motion. She did rule on that yesterday after court. Right. She dropped that decision. It was 24 pages. She didn't address it in court. She could have, but she didn't. Second motion is that motion to disqualify Michael Morrissey's office and the Norfolk DA's office um, for showing such complete bias when he gave that statement and for mm -hmm. a lot of other reasons. That motion is still out there flapping in the wind um, because Alan Jackson said at the last hearing they were going to be 
filing by the end of the day another motion to dismiss based on egregious governmental misconduct. So at this hearing, you'll see what the judge has to say about that, that Mm -hmm. the the reason I didn't rule on the motion to disqualify is because you said you were going to supplement that motion. But really Mm -hmm. what he did say was that it's a totally different motion on different grounds. So yeah, I'm not surprised that people were confused. And then uh, there was something about getting notes from from interviews that Lally had about a couple of weeks before the grand jury. Lally had a lot of interviews with a lot of a people. Lot of interviews. With a lot of witnesses that he does not represent in this case before their grand jury testimony God. and before even their state grand jury testimony. So before the federal grand jury and then state grand jury. And the defense is looking for all those notes of those interviews and the memorandum and whatever notes that they took. At yeah, those interviews so. that Lally is first going to deny, then he's going to suddenly remember. Rightfully so. All right. Uh, just if you want to stop at any point, just let me know. Just say pause, and and uh, but I'll, I'll try to go through this. I was <laughs> I was confused. I was like, what's going on here? I will explain Good it. Good morning, Mr. Lally. Good morning, Mayor Navarro McLaughlin for the couple. Good, like, yeah. Good morning, Mr. McLaughlin. Good morning, Ms. Unetti. And good morning, Your Honor. Ian Henty on behalf of Karen Reed. Ian Jackson should be with us on this. Okay, uh, good morning, Ms. Tanchi. Good morning, Mr. Jackson. And good morning, Ms. Reed. All right. So- oh, real quick, I just want to pull this up. Aaron's asking, can they say there are just no notes? Yeah, and he that's probably what he should have he said. Do, but right? instead, he's saying, we're not going to give you the notes because they constitute work product, attorney work product. Therefore, yeah. you're not entitled to them. So we don't Trent- have any notes. We didn't take notes. Yeah. Scott chiming in with a four month membership. Thank you, Scott, for the support. Love you, man. I've met you in person. Such a great guy. Auntie Bev bust in two juries from uh, d- from WC for the two Chesna trials to protect the defendant. She can remote ju- remote a jury and a bus for them uh, in Karen Reed's case also. Gee, I hope not. <laughs> I hope not. So in court, our counsel who will argue the motions for today. Uh, and uh, there's only Mr. Henchy and Ms. Yanetti. Um, when I set dates on the modified scheduling order, I set dates that were. Who are those people? Wait, convenient. can you stop for one okay, second? So Nick Rocco, can you right tell here. me who these people are? Okay, good. Because I think I, I don't know who, who anybody is. In the, I don't despite know the fact that everyone is. thinks I know everyone and I'm paid by everyone, I don't know who these people are. So tell That's us. That's Nick Rocco. Okay. I don't know who this is. And I think this is part of Karen's family. This okay. may, and I'm probably wrong. I know that I know this gentleman is, um, and I don't know what the relationship is there. Is, Nick Rocco was on uh, Court TV, I think, yes, recently, right? Probably he, people. Does he the... run a Facebook page or something? A, a Karen Reed Facebook page? Yeah. Yeah, he's one of the largest supporters. He helps with uh, her campaigns and, and raising funds for her for her defense. Okay. So that's cool. her brother. Thank you. Yeah, that's her brother. Whose brother? Uh, Karen Reed's brother. Karen's brother is right there in the on the left. Okay. Right here. Yeah. All right. And I would Thank probably you. assume that's. Uh, all right, so we'll keep motion of mainly defense counsel's trial schedule. And for dad. last week I renewed the Pro Hoc Vici motion. Um, but I see Mr. Jackson chose not to be here today, and so counsel will argue the motion here. <laughs> the, uh, this Brian morning. Albert's so, butt dial. Uh, but, uh, Alan Jackson oh, chose yeah. not to be here today. Alan Jackson chose not to be here. He told you that he was going to be on trial. Okay. Hmm. So it's like, I feel like at the, at the top of every hearing, she's got to give a list of reasons why she doesn't like attorneys coming in from out of state. He and chose not O'Keefe's to be brother. here today. That's John O'Keefe's brother right there. Paul. Yes. Yeah. Paul. Paul. And, um, I have been told repeatedly from both Mr. Jackson and Ms. Giannetti, and I do understand completely that Ms. Giannetti cannot be here today. He certainly excused from being here today. Uh, but I was told that there would be a motion for egregious, a motion to dismiss based on egregious government misconduct. Mm. Uh, I had asked Ms. I was told that by both Mr. Jackson and Ms. Giannetti. Uh, I asked Ms. Giannetti how that motion to dismiss was any different than the motion for sanctions and um, motion to disqualify the district attorney's office. Um, He assured me that it was in fact different. He assured me that um, he would put in the body of the motion how it was different. And he assured me as recently as last week that that motion 
would be filed later that day. So that motion has not been filed. Um, that motion then is waived. So what we have today are two motions regarding Rule 14 obligation. I'm sorry, Melanie. What was the motion that just got waived? So at the last hearing, remember, um, Yannetti said, uh, I'm going to be filing. A or she said, is there any more motions coming? He said, I'm going to be filing a motion at, by the end of the day for uh, dismissal that. based on egregious governmental misconduct. And she said, well, isn't that the same motion you already filed? And he said, no, this is different. It's on different grounds. Well, you're going to have to show me why this is different and why it's on different grounds. And he said, OK, I'll file it by the end of the day. He did not. Uh -huh. Tennis, his sister, who is there, is going to say that was a strategic decision. She's complaining that it wasn't filed. And here's what you should do. And this is what a, a clerk would typically do in a case like this. If, if it didn't come in by the end of the day, Jim there, Miss, Miss Jim, should be picking up the phone to you and say, listen, I didn't see this hit the court docket. Say, are you going to be filing it or not? And he'd be like, yeah, no, we're not going to. And be like, okay, thanks. Bye. Like mm -hmm. for her to sit there and be like, it wasn't filed. Now it's waived. Okay. They had a reason. That, and, she, and she's going to say, I would have decided that motion already, but I was waiting for that motion. Really? Mm. You've been waiting since last week for something right. that you said had a deadline by the end of the day? Like, it's 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 so disingenuous to me. Uh, it's very odd. I find it interesting that her her attitude towards Jackson, when all the Fed stuff got introduced into this, what, two hearings ago, she was so nice. And all that extra time you need. And, and whatever, you know, we'll, we'll help you out. And now it's just like that nasty attitude again is starting to come back out. It's interesting. Yeah. So who's going to argue? I, my Is it Ms. Ginetti or? I will be arguing. Okay, so I need you at a microphone. So I will hear you on the motion where you're looking for notes, reports, memoranda, and logs. Thank you. Your Honor, at the outset, I just want to note that as this court is aware. All right, so I have actually an attorney question. So Yanetti obviously is Karen's attorney. How does he? How is he able to step out and his sister step in for him? Would she be actually hired? She's on the team as well, or is this she's of counsel to the firm? So she's already employed by uh, his firm. So they had to put in a motion to have her come in for him in order to let Alan Jackson and Ms. Little appear without Yanetti David as the supervising attorney, because in Massachusetts, the supervising attorney mm -hmm. who's admitted in Massachusetts has to be in court. But they did file all the proper papers because he knew he wasn't going to be there today. I don't know why he's not there. It doesn't really matter. The guy's allowed to take a day off. Who knows? But And his sister is there in his stead, which is fine. But yeah, mm. she works for his firm. So, so she, yeah, as long as a representative. But they have, they, they, you know, in true judge fashion, she made them jump through a lot of hoops to get there. And she's going to keep reminding them of that. Of course. <laughs> we have a motion pending before the court to disqualify the Norfolk DA's office from this case. Our position, therefore, is that the DA's office should not be participating in this case or arguing any motions, including this one. And I raise this issue just to alert the court that we are not waiving any objection to their continued involvement in the case. Okay, so I haven't decided that because I was waiting for the motion for egregious conduct, uh, motion for sanctions or motion to dismiss based on egregious governmental misconduct. Still waiting? Because I needed to be assured that that was Still waiting. Yeah. She's still waiting. Still waiting. Who can name that song? Still waiting. I think it was the Talking Heads. Um, but that. how long ago was this last hearing? So she's still waiting. She said the deadline was that day. Everything is e-filed, so it would have been e-filed that day. Hmm. Uh, wasn't that? That was the 12th, right? 12th. Yep. And what's today? 27th. Wait, wasn't there a hearing on the 20th? There was a hearing on the 20th. So that 20th. was seven um, days ago. a week ago. A week ago, she's still yeah. waiting after a week. She's still waiting for it. She's still waiting. Come on. Come on. Different than the motion to disqualify. If I had known it was not coming and maybe no intention of filing it, I would have decided that motion by now. Your Honor, there was a, it was a strategic decision okay. for us not to file that motion. It's not because it wasn't meritorious. It was a strategic decision. All only. right. You made representations that you were, therefore the other motion I have not acted on that yet. I just want so, you to note the objection, please. Yeah, the objection's noted. So please Love move her. on to the merits yes, of your discovery request. Uh, absolutely. Your Honor, we're asking for material that fits squarely within the parameters of Rule 14. Statements were made to investigators in this case, including to Mr. Lally and to his staff. So this is where you're going to argue that 
getting those notes, right? The, the notes from all of these statements that were taken during these meetings to prep for either grand jury, grand jury or other meetings that we don't know when they happened or what they were about, but they gleaned this information from whatever the feds gave them. And now they're like, we know, Lally, that you and the victim advocate, victim and witness advocate met with all of these people. And some of they have dates for, some they don't. But we want the notes and the statements that you took. Because guess what? Can't. You don't represent them, mm. Lally. You're not their lawyer. They're witnesses. They're independent witnesses. I just don't understand, Melanie. You know, people, if you're, I don't, the people that are the deniers as to what's going on in this case, I, I just don't know why you can't wake up by now. It's so clear as to what's going on. I mean, there's a lot of egregious things going on by the Commonwealth, in my opinion. I mean, it's just... A lot, a lot of shit that's not good or straight. And <laughs> in certain conversations, the state police were even present. Statements of witnesses are simply discoverable. Although they lodged general objections to each of our requests, and these were really boilerplate objections, the Norfolk DA's office appears to be arguing that these witness statements contained in their notes of their conversations, multiple conversations, are all work product. Neither this court nor we are in a position to judge whether the notes are strictly work product without actually seeing the notes. Work product is defined as legal research, opinions, theories, or conclusions. And to be clear, we are not interested in the Norfolk DA's office's opinions, theories, or conclusions. <laughs> so we don't agree with any to, of them. To the extent that these notes <laughs> contain work product along with the statements, we are fine with the work product being redacted. We are not interested in their work product, but it is important for us to know whether their notes contain any statements of witnesses. And if they do, they should be turned. Question from the audience. Sarah asked, Melanie, have you ever seen a judge act so biased? Sure. <laughs> yeah, sure. It happens a lot. Happens a lot. And, it, you know, it depends if when you're sitting there from the outside, you're looking at it. And depending, depending on what side you're leaning towards, you always think the judge is being unfair to the other side. I mean, we see this in a lot. Okay, look at Delphi. I mean, there's a perfect example. Yeah. Um, she might, that judge might be far worse. This is just, you know, this is, this is par for the course. I know we take it personally, but it's not that unusual. It's just, I feel like she just is like, it's, there's always got to be a dig about, you know, in Massachusetts, this is the in way we do it here, you know? Right. We stand. We stand in Massachusetts. Remember yeah. With, uh, Jackson, we stand in Massachusetts. Yes, exactly oh, what gosh. I was thinking of. God. Turned over to us. Otherwise, discoverable material is not off limits simply because a prosecutor writes something in the margins of a document that would give an attorney the power to keep otherwise discoverable materials out of the hands of a party who should legally be entitled to see the material. At a minimum, Your Honor, this court should order the Norfolk DA's office to disclose whether its notes contain any statements. They have not disclosed that. If the notes contain any witness statements and if the Norfolk DA's office is objecting to producing them to the defense, then this court, we're asking this court to have the DA's office produce those notes to the court so that this court can conduct an in-camera review of those note, of their notes and evaluate whether they are truly all work product or whether there is in fact discoverable material contained therein. Hmm. Beyond that, Your Honor, we would rest on our motion in a brief. Okay. Yeah. Thank and that you. seems Thank like, you. Mr. Lally, your response. Seems like a reasonable compromise, right? Like they don't have to turn them over to us, Judge. How about they turn them over to you and you look through them and you see whether or not they're work product. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, just keep it fair and equal down down the center. You know, just mm -hmm. have have her look at it, and you know how she's probably going to rule on it anyway. So, response, please. <laughs> yeah, sure. Oh boy, here we go. And your honor, I'll be brief. Um, so essentially, what the defendant's motion uh, seeks is is. And I would object to the. You know that I went back. I don't. I don't know if you saw it, but I went back and compared Lally from literally his first day in court, uh, reading the indictment, and then like you looked at his phys physical stature, he was like had all his hair. He wasn't gray. Stop. Like in two years, he's really? like aged so much. I think we should 
to make bingo cards and like that'll be like everyone get a bingo card and be like okay i'll be brief okay so that's on that's totally on my bingo card because he says that every time size. i'll be brief the I'll size brief. when he, when he and then listen you'll hear later um i'm not sure if it's yeah it's during this hearing the judge is like heavy breathing into the microphone i think it's the judge i can't confirm but it's almost like she's like probably both of them like remember the old phony phone calls where people used to call up and do heavy breathing on the phone yes somebody's heavy breathing into the mic it's not me it's not you brian somebody in this courtroom all right well listen the mischaracterization of every single phone call or conversation with a witness as an interview with a witness but um I'm, I'm not even sure what half of these are referring to as as i don't recall any of those specific meetings occurring um but if there were meetings any meeting with a witness post grand jury was in reference to uh either harassment that they were sustaining as a result of of actions of others in this case or Pause. as a result of Pause. uh yep. somebody pointed this out to me because we went over the documents today He's saying all these meetings were the result of harassment in this yeah, case. He said By who? By who do you think? By who? Who do you think he's referring to? No, he said people in this case, though, but he's saying he's trying to refer to terms. We're being harassed. He said that he was meeting with Jen McCabe, Matt McCabe, Brian Albert, because they were being harassed by people. And here's the thing Aiden did not start covering this case until when? May of 2023, right? Yeah. These meetings happened before that. Before that. So how can he say? First, right. he's like, I don't remember any of these meetings, but but if they did happen, it's only because they came to me because they were being harassed. And he Think said, the by people there, in this had case, an excellent point. He's, but he said, by people in this case, Aiden is not involved in Karen Reed's case. But who else he's would he not be referring to? Legally bound by her case. That's no, but who else would he be re referring to? Who else would be oh, harassing them? Right? I mean, we have to take that as what we think he's talking about. Mm -hmm. So says, this is an incredible point. Yeah, somebody pointed that out. And I think it might have been Aiden in my chat earlier or or somebody who knew was like, he didn't oh. start hand. So, and I think somebody even said, I don't know, we can go back and find out when his first blog post was, but they testified in front of the grand jury. It's in the documents, what they're looking for here. They testified in front of the, the federal grand jury now, May 4th of 2023. And the documents that they're looking for of these witnesses, I mean, these interviews, was a meeting that happened three weeks before May 4th of 2023, mm. which I think is before he started reporting on this case. Mm -hmm. Well, in April, he's they say April 2023 was his first post about this case. Okay, so alleged harassment. This was three weeks before May 4th of 2023, this first meeting. Second one is two weeks before Matthew McCabe testified on May 4th of 2023. Mm -hmm. Then there was uh, a meeting with ryan nagel in february of 2023 that they want the notes for uh lally meeting with brian albert nicole chris and julie so there's other ones that are in here that don't have dates yeah and, and scott points out turtle boy wasn't even fully in the picture yet that's just lally's excuse to be coddling the witnesses in his office 100 percent. and they said april 18 2023 melanie i want to go back and actually just listen to that again because okay. he said people in this case okay yeah let's right, let's let's hear this again <clears throat> and your honor i'll be brief um so essentially what the defendant's motion uh seeks is is and I would object to the mischaracterization of every single phone call or conversation with a witness as an interview with a witness, but um, I'm, I'm not even sure what half of these are referring to as, as I don't recall any of those specific meetings occurring. Um, but if there were meetings, any meeting with a witness post grand jury was in reference to uh, either harassment that they were sustaining as a result of, of actions of others in this case. As actions, actions of, of others. others in this case. Yeah, he doesn't mean others in this case. He means as actions of others, they're being harassed because they are in this case. That's what I think he means. Mm. But if you look at the timeline. Yeah. It doesn't jive on my bingo card. It don't jive. It don't jive. As a result of uh, a simple explanation as to Rule 17 motions that have been filed for individuals' phones or phone records or uh, other uh, third-party records that they were the subject of. It's a boilerplate response because it's a boilerplate 
uh, law that applies in this case, uh, as far as uh, work product uh, that applies uh, to each and every one of the uh, requests, with the exception of number eight, of which the Commonwealth has uh, no objection to that. Explain to me how work product applies. Your Honor, work product applies uh, it, and specifically in reference to, uh, it, I mean, it's... He's a little lost there, too. He said, eh, wasn't ready for that one. Mm-hmm. Contained within, uh, and I would largely rest on the Commonwealth's motion, but it's yeah, contained it's within uh, what's cited as. Uh, Go ahead, Melly. He's like, yeah, it's in my papers, Judge. I'm not ready to yeah. argue this, like you said, but it's in my papers. Can I just rest on my papers? I'm going to tell you, it's not in that document that you got, buddy. <laughs> Thanks, C.L. Lang. Uh, in regard to uh, interview notes, uh, in preparation of, of testimony, is work product under the case <laughs> law, under the rule of criminal procedure. Um, the uh, whatever notations uh, may be contained uh, within those. Um, but essentially, uh, these are not statements um, as are defined under Rule 14 um, from any of these uh, conversations uh, with witnesses. Uh, Rule 14 doesn't apply uh, to these statements, number one. But secondly, if there is uh, any content, uh, it's either already been uh, provided through the course of discovery, whether it be contained within a police report, grand jury minutes, uh, there's nothing different uh, than, than what has already been provided. And then secondly, uh, what the case law states and what Rule 14 states is that these types of conversations uh, uh, with witnesses, whether reduced to writing or not, um, you know, are within the ambit of, of the work product doctrine. All right, any response? You don't necessarily have to, but I just want to see if you want to. Um, I, I would just say, Your Honor, there, there. Like, I just want to stick a pitchfork in you when you get back up there again. <laughs> but why is she like explaining it to her like she's a child? You know, she's mm -hmm. she, well. You know, you don't you don't have to if you don't want to. But if you do, you need to step up to the microphone. Like it's the first time that Tana Zianetti has ever been inside of a courtroom before. Like I just find it to be so patronizing. Yeah. Go ahead, get up there. I'm just gonna throw some digs at you. Opposition to our motion <clears throat> does not even acknowledge whether there are statements or not statements. I just heard Mr. Lally say that there in fact are statements. So I am going to ask again that this court take those notes there and, and go through it and in camera and decide whether in fact all of it is work product or whether there exists within it um, discoverable materials with statements of witnesses. And I find it hard to believe that there wouldn't be any statements of witnesses nice. concerning this case. Thank you. Do you want to respond at all? Your Honor, again, with reference to the, as they term them, interviews, but essentially phone calls with witnesses, these were in regard to explaining to them the Rule 17 process, explaining to them what counsel had filed, what types of records were being requested. Um, it was in large part me talking as far as explaining the law and things of that nature. There were not any statements related to the case or any um, testimony that was discussed or anything. Go ahead. Like, like they weren't screaming at him. Why the hell do they want my phone records? They're not entitled to my phone records. What the hell? Right. right. It was just him explaining to them no. what rule 17 means. And he didn't remember anything about these meetings. Couldn't recall any of them, but now all of a sudden, Oh, that's right. We did. They were phone calls. Mm -hmm. There weren't meetings. It was phone calls, but it was just me explaining. I was just explaining. Explaining. It was loudly explaining. Of that nature. Um, the one thing that I was referring to is there is one request that does deal with uh, a meeting which involves uh, preparation of a witness for grand jury. And whatever that witness uh, indicated in the course of that was testified to before the grand jury. It's contained within the minutes and contained within uh, police reports of interviews uh, with that same witness. So there's, there's nothing to report. All right. All right. The next motion is the Commonwealth's motion for reciprocal discovery. But before we begin with that, Mr. Lally, could you tell me what reciprocal discovery has been provided to the Commonwealth at this point? Nothing. Okay. Pause. Absolutely nothing. Okay, this was a huge deal in the cesspool of Twitter. Everyone's like, they have not turned over anything. The defense has not turned over anything. They are lying. They are lying, cheating, mm -hmm. stealing thieves. Here's the rule, and I'm going to say it really loud for people in the back. The defense does not have to turn over anything until the <laughs> Commonwealth has turned over 
all of it. And they haven't. This trial is supposed to start in three weeks. And they still don't have the um the the alleged human hair DNA back from Bodhi Labs. So from the lab. The defense, their time, the clock does not start for them to turn over this automatic discovery and this reciprocal discovery. A lot of people are like, what's reciprocal discovery? What does that mean? The defense has to tell the, the prosecution what experts they're going to call. They have to turn over the experts' reports. They have to maybe give them a list of witnesses. It's called automatic discovery. <clears throat> but their time to turn that over does not start until the Commonwealth has turned, well, over turned everything. everything over and and filed a certificate of compliance. And they have not yet done that. Mm -hmm. So yeah. all of that anger that these people have against the defense is misplaced because their time did not start to run yet. And guess what else? The defense doesn't have to prove a damn thing. They don't have to prove who killed Officer Tommy John O'Keefe. Yep. They don't have to prove anything. They mm -hmm. don't even have to put on a case if they don't want to. So mm -hmm. a lot of people out there trolling don't really understand the procedure or the law. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's not that it's not the defenses to prove anything. It's just to defend and say it didn't happen and show the evidence that supports that it didn't happen. Uh, so Callie's saying, uh, would you would they really turn over any real notes? I assume they have been lost by now. Yeah, we think we kind of talked about that earlier. Right. Wouldn't you just say that nothing exists? Yeah. They don't exist. We don't have any notes. We don't have any statements. They don't exist. But instead, he pulled out the work product card, which yeah. is not going to play well, I don't think. This guy just did right. not want so to be So trial there. is three weeks from today. Um, <laughs> when off, did like, the Commonwealth? I'm going to tell you, man. <laughs> Wait, did you ever watch The Incredibles? Is it The Incredibles with the guy who's got like the hunchback yeah. and he walks around like I forget his name? Anybody know the Incredibles I, I character that I'm talking about? I got to say so. I know I get shit for this all the time. I kind of feel bad for the guy a little I do bit. Too. At the end like, of the day. He's the one that's going to go down and they're going to be like, you fucking lost. They laid this on him. Like, it's like, here, dude, here's the files. Enjoy. Yeah. You, you don't think, think Michael Marcy was going to come in and try his face every day? <laughs> You're going all the way. <laughs> it's like just screaming at him. <laughs> wow. He just uh, look at the body length. He's just like, get me out of this case. I want gone. Um, and people say he chain smokes in the um, parking lot. Oh, he's like, oh my, god, oh, my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. What am I gonna? Oh my god. And I, like, I, I do, I do feel bad for him. I feel like he's uh, the fall guy here. You know, it's, nobody. It's like a hot potato. It's like you take it, you take it, you take it. It's like hot potato over there. Lally got caught with the hot potato, and he's like, I'm just gonna oh, get up here, judge, and I'm just gonna do the best that I can. Certificate. Um, so the Commonwealth is un unable to file a certificate of compliance at this That's point. The one <laughs> I would say sort of primary piece that we're waiting on is uh, there were two rounds of DNA testing that were done at the Bodie Lab in Virginia. One of those was completed. Um, that was in regard to. Uh, oh, so this is interesting too because you talked about me and you talked about this backstage about this trial that's supposed to start in three weeks, mm -hmm. and they're talking about right now. Getting those lab results is probably not even going to happen uh, before that April thirteenth deadline. <laughs> yeah, before you know, mid-April, maybe we'll get. I we paid for an, for them to expedite it, Your Honor, but you know, we don't know. They're telling us mid-April. Yeah, the defendant's tail light uh, that was finished. I think first week of March, and counsel already has all of that. Uh, the second piece is in relation to uh, the hair from uh, the rear of the defendant's vehicle. Um, just for sort of review purposes, that was something that uh, had gone or undergone um, sort of typical DNA testing, which is autosomal DNA testing, which is taking um, the profile from or attempting to uh, take the profile from the nucleus of the cell. Um, and it relates to essentially both biological parents. That sample was of well, insufficient like quality or um, quantity. How, how many biological parents does the horse hair of a snow brush have? <laughs> Gelding or mare? <laughs> I'm stealing that joke from somebody else in the comments earlier today. But really, is this where we're going? And now he's going to keep. He's going to say, um, "Oh, but we may not have it back at all." And she's going to say, "Well, then I'm going to exclude it." So that's probably what's going to happen. They're going to walk this back and backpedal and be like, "Oh, we can't get it in time." They're just going to be like, "Okay, well, we're just going to exclude it then." There will be no evidence about any alleged hair found on the bumper. But, you know, out in the media, it's already a human hair. That is actually John O'Keefe's hair. So, you know, there's that. But even even if it was, 
wouldn't John's hair be in Karen's SUV anyway? I mean, in oh, no, saying it was in, aren't they saying it was on the bumper? On the yeah. on the bumper it in was, the tail light? I can't right, even keep it, was, it straight at this point. It was on it was on the bumper that was towed 33 right. miles <laughs> from Dighton to Canton in a in snowstorm a in a blizzard. Yeah, and it just magically glued itself there. I, I don't know. Yeah. And and don't you think, I mean, look. If he was, you know, I've seen some crazy graphic of him like bent over with like the bumper like hitting him in the head, right? And like yeah. smashing his head and he's got the big all right, this is not funny in any way, shape, or right. form. And, and <clears throat> may Officer John O'Keefe rest in peace. This is not funny at all. But if he was hit in the head and that's what caused that big gash on the back of his head, don't you think there would have been a lot more than one hair that is too small to even be tested? Would Wouldn't there say. be a lot more hairs? Because I've seen the picture of that gash. I'm sure you have too. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty big and it's pretty wide. And there would be a lot of hair. Mm -hmm. Um, so why isn't there a bunch of blood all over the bumper either? I mean, that injury looked like it would be, it would just, you know. Yes. Um, another thing that's kind of crazy, and I I I someone sent me a video, a, a fan of the channel sent me a video, and I believe it was of her son-in-law or something. And it showed him outside his work truck and something was going on his work truck and she was filming it. And he literally took a snow shovel and started hitting the back of the truck because he was pissed something was going on. And he was hitting the taillight. And it's a similar taillight to uh, Karen Reed's taillight. Guess what happened to the taillight? Nothing. Nothing. I mean, he was full swing, baseball bat swinging. Nothing happened to that taillight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And somebody else also pointed, you know, they're talking about these microscopic pieces in the clothing. Uh, somebody also said that polycarbonate does not shatter into microscopic pieces. It's yeah. virtually impossible. So I don't know. We gotta Maybe get a it was a bicycle lesson. reflector. <laughs> Could have been. Could have been. <laughs> I mean, uh, Lady Law, one of my mods is checking in. Thanks for the $2. She says, the best attorney Melanie Little role model. Thank, thank you so you. much. That's awesome. All right, let's get back to Lally Splaining. <laughs> Oh boy. Rate a sample under the autosomal. Uh, so we had asked uh, and the court had ordered uh, for the mitochondrial yeah, DNA testing, which goes to the maternal Where's side the uh, only. Um, and the Bodhi Lab is able to do that. My latest update from that, it, and I say all that just to build up as to a sort of caveat as far as the, the testing is concerned. So the initial estimate as far as the testing was uh, would put us several weeks Here's out. Here's where the breathing, um, wait, the pause for just one sec. I'm sorry, I keep, I keep well, interrupting, him. but here is where the breathing starts really up in the microphone. So for all of you listeners out there, this is not Brian nor I breathing heavily into the microphone. You are hearing it directly from whoever else in that court is breathing. It's Lally. It's Lally. That's his typical. He said it was the judge. I know they both do. Because if you listen, he's talking, and you can hear the breath sounds behind his speech. It's somebody else. Let's listen. No, it's him. Let's it's take leaving. a listen. All right. Listen, it is him. Watch. As to a sort of caveat as far as the, the testing is concerned. So the initial estimate as far as no. the testing was uh, would put us several weeks out. Uh, we had asked that it be extra. Melanie, I will debate this with you. That is it's in the background. It's totally in the background because he can't breathe that heavily while he's speaking. And you can see while he's speaking, it's like. <gasps> it's him because he's ripping butts in the parking lot before. <laughs> It's Darth I mean, Vader. I hear him sighing also, but I think it's because I have an earbud in, and that's why I can only hear it in this one ear. Okay. I, I don't know. I know. Uh, we're Casey, making this into a comedy show. <laughs> Thanks, Casey. Casey, and it, believe me, this is very, very serious. I mean, we're... we're not, yeah. But Casey, if, if we don't laugh, we're, we're going to cry, so... Right. Casey with the two, thank you so much. My favorite duo, thank you for all your insight. Well, thank you for being here. We appreciate it. All right, let's try to get through this. Expedited. We had paid for it to be expedited. Uh, and the quickest that they can turn around report would be sometime in mid-April. Um, the caveat to that is whether or not there is a sufficient uh, quantity and quality for them to generate a mitochondrial DNA profile from the sample. That I should have an answer to, I was told, by the end of the month. So hopefully by the, either the end of this week or very early next week, um, because obviously if they aren't able to generate a mitochondrial DNA profile from the sample, then there's no oh, I hear the breathing generate now. one from the victim and do a comparison. Uh, so that would sort of end it there, and then we would then be able to file the certificate of compliance. Oh, right. Every other aspect of the case, though? 
Every other aspect of the case, uh, it, as I mentioned, there was a number eight in the defendant's motion to compel uh, that we should have uh, to them by the end of this week, if not earlier. Um, so every other aspect of the case, as far as discovery goes, uh, should be should be done from the Commonwealth's perspective. And that's the reason that I filed the motion, Your Honor, at this time, understanding that they're not obligated under the rules. Of so I'll let you know, Melanie, my, my dad just texted me. He said, this is a classy lady. He said, please try not to use street language. She doesn't allow it on her show. Just saying, yes, we need to keep it classy. We keep Wait, it right. your dad watches my show? My dad is watching right now. That is, but he watches my show. He yes, said he knows of that. Wow, thanks, Brian's dad. I appreciate that so much. That's he so said, funny. You are a classy lady. So. See, I make everybody better. Yes. Here. <laughs> we'll I keep try. it classy. So we're, not, we're not cupcakes, right? We're not cupcakes. No, we provide not. anything, but given that we have an April 16th trial date and I have nothing as far as any sort of reports or notice of okay. experts or testing or anything really at all, um, you know, you know I'd appreciate being able to to get that, review that, or at least see it, you know, prior to the day we're in paneling. All right. What do you say, counsel? Your Honor, as you know, we do, we do not owe them any reciprocal discovery until they file a certificate of compliance, which has not been... Boom. There you go. Right there, Melanie. There's your point. Well, She's like, wait, as you know, and I love her. She had this power move while she was sitting. She had her hands folded like this. That's a total power move. And while he was speaking, she was just looking straight ahead. She didn't even look at him. She's watching mm -hmm. for the judge's reaction. She's mm -hmm. seasoned, and I like her a lot. She is Queen Tannis. I have a girl crush on her, I think. <laughs> I mean, we have received, sorry, we have received hundreds of pages of, of documents. I mean, four days ago, we received uh, like 400 pages of documents we haven't gone through. Um, counsel just handed us a thumb drive with, I don't know what's on this thumb drive. We have to go through that. So we haven't given any reciprocal discovery because we are not obligated to do so. Do you intend to call experts? Yes. In areas other than DNA? I'm going to have to defer to uh, Mr. Jackson, who is on Zoom. So All right, but counsel to arguing these motions. So, wait, let her let her finish her sentence because oh, then I gotta jump in. I'm gonna go back a little bit here. Here we go. Yes. Let Bev. I mean, in areas judge. other than DNA. I'm going to have to defer to uh, Mr. Jackson, who is on Zoom. So All right, but counsel to arguing these motions was to be present here in court today. What is that? Right. Your Honor, if I can be... So go ahead, Melanie. Counsel arguing this motion was to be present here in court today. So I'm not going to let Mr. Jackson speak on Zoom, Ms. Yanetti. You're going to have to argue this. First of all, this is not the motion that... This is not part of the motion. This is her asking them if they intend to call experts. The motion Mark. that they're talking about is whether these notes should be turned over. So for her to say, I'm going to defer to Mr. Jackson on this, she's not trial counsel. She's stepping in for the day to argue this motion. And she was very well prepared to argue this motion. Mm -hmm. She's like, oh, I'm not going to let Mr. Jackson speak because I told you that they had to be in court today. And he's not here. He didn't. Karen didn't pay for him to fly in from L.A. for this 17 minute hearing. So I'm right. going to bust your, your yeah, gonna, you know, yeah, word yeah. that I won't say about yeah. it. And and I think it's all uh, it's it's awfully funny that when Jackson starts to speak up, he's like on mute all of a sudden and they, she mutes him. She goes, Oh, Oh, that was me. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry mm -hmm. about that. <clears throat> all right, let's go back here. <clears throat> he heard for just a second on that issue. Mr. Lally made it very clear that given the fact that he was not in, in, in compliance with his discovery obligations, that this motion was not to be heard today. So this is sort of coming out of nowhere. Uh, no, 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 no. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. So Mr. Lally so what's going on here? She's treating them like children. Hmm. He says, uh, Judge, Yanetti, um, Mr. Lally knows that he has not complied with his discovery obligations. And so now you're coming at me. Lally said we weren't going to even argue this today because he knows that he has not complied with his discovery obligations. And she's like, no, 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 no. I decide what we what we argue here, not Mr. Lally. Like there are really. a bunch of Lally doesn't decide what motions were to be argued. Okay. Today was for all non-evidentiary pre-trial motions were to be argued. This was filed timely. This was on for today. If you feel that you cannot argue it, that's a different oh. story. Na, 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 na. That's not so you what are they're muted. arguing. She's asking him if they intend to call expert witnesses at trial. That's not part mm -hmm. of this motion. Mr. Jackson, you're muted. 
Jax is probably sweating. I don't know how I got muted. Uh, yes, we are uh, intending to, to call experts, and there are going to be experts that, that are in areas other than DNA as well. But we haven't provided discovery because we don't even know what the 400 pages that we just, or 500 pages that we just got three or four days ago include, nor the discovery that was handed to us this morning. As soon as the, the Commonwealth gets finished with their compliance obligations, we will then comply with our discovery obligations. We have every intention of doing so. We're fully prepared to do so. We're waiting on them. So once you get it from the Commonwealth, you can have it in a matter of a day or so, other than the DNA? A day or so? I don't know if I can do it in a day. Yeah. But well, it's a little... A day? The experts, the experts that they call at trial are 100% going to be dependent upon whatever discovery they get. If they get discovery about this hair and DNA testing, they're going to have to call an expert on that. If they don't get it, mm -hmm. they don't need that expert. But mm -hmm. in a day, really? It's yeah. taken them over two years to turn over discovery. And they just handed us a thumb drive this morning and 500 pages four days ago. But you want me to tell you who my expert is going to be and have reports ready for you within 24 hours? And I was just going to say, they still haven't turned over anything. <laughs> they haven't turned over everything. We're still trying to get notes from this pre this these meetings that happened uh before the first the first hearings like ay 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 what a mess you, you, have you, you do know if you're calling witnesses you know who you're calling correct no i have an idea who i'm yeah. calling yes all right and you've engaged experts so you've been working with experts so you should have all that information ready to disclose correct we're in, in the process of getting those decisions finalized, yes. But some of them are going to be predicated on what the, the, right. the Commonwealth don't. discovery and the, the totality of the Commonwealth yeah. discovery looks like. I mean, right. That's their obligation. I mean, you right. can't line up an expert if you don't have all the information to line up that expert. Right, if, because if your you expert is going to refute what their experts are going to say. Yeah, if you need a DNA expert and we don't have all the DNA evidence, how the hell can I call a DNA expert? Right. <laughs> what the hell? But hey, look, I understand. Three weeks. We got three weeks. Yeah, three weeks. Let's go. And I'm going to give you a day to figure <laughs> it all out. And, all yeah. right. But you will be calling witnesses and you will be calling expert witnesses. Absolutely. All right. What is your estimate as to how long this case will take to try? I assume if the if the Commonwealth case, I'm just throwing a, a dart at a dartboard, but based right. on what I know, if the Commonwealth case no takes three to four weeks, I think our case would probably take two weeks. Okay. All right. Mr. Lally, I suggest that you get that information as soon as possible. Um, it could be that I strike it, but um, I would hear from the defense on that as well. But at least find out if they're able to do the testing. Yeah, sure. All right. Really? We're more right. than two years into this Thank trial. You. And you have your next date. We'll see you then. At least could you find out if they can do the testing? I mean, trials are three weeks away. Think you could maybe do that? Hmm? This is crazy. And then all this back and forth. I thought three weeks ago we were supposed to – remember the, the statement from, from the judge was, we're going to come into the courtroom and we're going to hash all this out. We're going to get it all out on the table. And why are we separating all these hearings now? Why, why all these continuous hearings, continuous, continuous, continuous – to me, my opinion, let's deplete the resources. Let's keep flying these people in. Let's keep wasting all this time when all this could have done, in my opinion, three or four weeks ago at the last hearing when when Jackson talked about the, uh, the, the federal investigation. Why didn't they just get this all on the table and why continue to do this? Because this, you know, they just requested this stuff, apparently, or they've been waiting for, you know, Lally to turn over these notes from these meetings. And I, I would assume that it wasn't until they looked at the Fed's stuff mm. that they started requesting this. So this actually is not something that was already sitting out there. Mm. So, you know, as the case goes on, more and more motions are going to be filed as they fail to comply. And we've seen them fail to comply with discovery for more than two years. 
All I've right. seen them turn over police reports that were changed <laughs> unknowingly, turning having turned over the original police report, and then they turn over the same police report, but it's got and different phone numbers on it and different photos. The statement has changed three times as to how John O'Keefe died. I mean, how many times are they going to keep revising that? It, it didn't work this way, so they debunk, you know, they debunk that, or, or they have evidence to support that it didn't happen by the way. So let's rewrite it, and we'll reintroduce it, and say that it happened this way, and. It's just insane. It's insane. All right, mm -hmm. let's go to this presentation that I talked, you know, we're going to talk yeah. tonight about uh, should or would Karen Reed need to take the stand uh, in her trial? And I'll be curious to see what you have to say about this, but we'll pull this up and go through a little bit of this. So uh, obviously, we're welcoming attorney Melanie Little. Thank you so much again for doing this. I appreciate it. And uh, we'll go to the first. So will Karen Reed have to take the stand? So I looked at some different things. And I kind of just sat back and, and did a three minute power session. Like how many things can I think about that the Commonwealth has this, puts their statement out there. And um, you know, what are some of the things that they had said? And then we'll look at what the defense uh, says. So first thing that came to mind was Karen Reed hit John, uh, John O'Keefe with her SUV and left him to die in the cold. Uh, they had the theory of the 24.2 miles per hour at 62 feet. That's how she supposedly killed John. Uh, the hair found on the bumper is John's. Uh, Karen, uh, Karen shattered her taillight uh, when she hit John. The injuries to John were caused by Karen hitting him with her SUV. Uh, Karen told Jen McCabe in all the frantic of what was going on in the middle of giving John uh, uh, CPR, turned to, to Jen in that movie moment and said, can you please Google how long it takes for someone to die of hypothermia? <laughs> It's the most ridiculous theory uh, when they turned the scene and found John. Uh, Karen Reed screams uh, in front of the EMS worker, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him. Uh, Karen stated uh, in, Karen stated in, uh, stated in front of Jen and Carrie could have hit him. Did I hit him? Uh, the six blood samples collected in solo cups uh, was John's blood uh, from the murder. John never went inside the house. We have the broken glass and the bumper that was embedded was first laying there, but now it's embedded. And that was from the drinking glass, uh, supposedly that John had taken with him that night uh, out of the waterfall bar. And then Karen was a jealous lover. That was a new thing that they were trying to spin. You know, yeah. she, she made out with Higgins and came on to Higgins and was this this jealous lover. Oh, and the Aruba, the Aruba situation yeah. where she was cursing at those people that she didn't even know. Yeah. Ah, oh, jeez. So now I come back and I look at the defense. First one for me, and I think that just solidifies everything, is that the FBI, uh, through an independent witness with three PhDs in, act, uh, in accident reconstruction, has confirmed that Karen Reed's SUV did not hit John O'Keefe nor cause the injuries to John O'Keefe. We have John's arm injuries, uh, and they're very consistent with the dog bites. And if you haven't seen Melanie's live, I urge you to go over and watch that live. It's probably one of the best lives that I've seen. Uh, in this case, but go over to Melanie's channel and check out uh, the live with uh, the dog bite expert. And I apologize, I forget his name um, that you did with him. Oh, and Garrett Wing. That's how I met you, actually, because you did a review of my show on your yeah. channel. And my sister saw it. She's like, this guy did a review of your show and he's so nice. And he says he wants you to come on his show. You should reach <laughs> out to him or whatever. And then you emailed me and that's how we met. So. Yep, that's right. It's so yeah. funny. You're right. That's right. Uh, Albert's owner, German Shepherd, that disappeared after the incident. Uh, Nagel, which is obviously the Commonwealth, he just didn't want Nagel there. He made this, I, I call it the 10 and 2 statement. Uh, you know, Karen was at 10 and 2. The dome light was on. John was not inside the SUV. So where was John? Uh, Commonwealth's theory uh, changed three times. Higgins and Albert communicated at 2 uh, 2.23 a.m. And then the FBI, again, one of the big sticking points that I stand by now, uh, it has been confirmed that Jen McCabe did Google uh, how long to die in cold at 227. And the Cellbrite and five other extraction softwares confirms that. Uh, Karen hits John uh, with Karen hits John's SUV when returning to the scene. She cracked her taillight. Uh, multiple cameras on Fairview didn't work that night for some reason. Uh, the three, the three, three, two or three minutes of footage. Uh, from the library is missing. FBI actively is still investigating the investigation. Uh, McAlberts and detectives have lied about their relationship and friendships with each other. We heard about the gifting. Uh, and then Karen was authentic. In, in my opinion, I think everybody's opinion in this uh, this chat, 
uh, that she was authentic during that 911 call. And then I went back to that and said, Karen gave John mouth to mouth, tried to save his life. Um, so we go into, you know, what would be the strategy, the reasons to take the stand? And uh, I don't know if you want to just chime in here. I'll read through some of these and see if you agree or disagree. Font is too small. I can't read it, but I'm <laughs> loving your PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> You're going to have to read it because I can't read it. Yeah, I'll read it. Hang on. Oh, let's see. Let's see if I can. There we go. We can zoom it in a little bit here. So reasons to take the stand. Uh, so one of the reasons you would look at is human, human, humanization and connection uh, with the jury. So direct testimony allows the defendant to connect with the jury on a personal level, potentially garnering sympathy or understanding. You have the clarification of the evidence. It provides an opportunity to address any misunderstandings or misrepre misrepresentations of the evidence presented by the prosecution. We have the assertion of innocence. Testifying allows the defendant to directly and em uh, empathetically assert their innocence which can be compelling to the jury. And then we have perception of transparency. By testifying, the defendant demonstrates a willingness to uh, be transparent and confront the, uh, uh, the allegations head on, potentially enhancing their credibility in the eyes of a jury. I'm just gonna ask you, Melanie, mm -hmm. how often is it that someone would take the stand and uh, you know, would, would you advise it in this case? Do you think Karen would have to? Um, it's going to depend completely on how the trial goes and, and what uh, happens during the trial. It's usually a game time decision. You know, you will get those defendants who are so narcissistic that they insist on getting up on the stand. Like Alec Murdoch is a great example of that. Mm -hmm, yeah. Uh, Alec Murdoch's attorneys probably said, dude, there is no way in hell that you can get on the stand. And he's like, I'm going to get on the stand. I'm going to get on the stand. I'm a lawyer. I'm going to, I'm going to be able to, and it convicted him. You have mm -hmm. people like, I don't know if you watched the Vander Ark trial, Shonda Vander Ark never should have gotten on the stand. Uh, the horrific things that she did to her own son. And that's a recent trial that just happened out of uh, Michigan, I think, Michigan. She got on the stand because she knew better than everyone and she had to try and explain herself. This is going to be a game time decision based on how the trial is going. And a bit, you, know, you can bet that both sides of this case are carefully watching the chats in all of these YouTube shows, including this mm. one to see what the general public thinks about this mm. case and what their views are and how they're feeling. And I will tell you, and they're reading Twitter and they're doing all this stuff. This is like research for them, right? Mm. It happened in the Maya Kowalski case that I was heavily involved in. I covered that case as well. I don't know if anybody in the chat watched the Maya Kowalski case with me, but it, the defense in that case, this was a civil case, but the defense in that case pulled their legal theories from Reddit, literally wow. Reddit threads and used them in their motions. Like it was crazy. So, what I have seen people saying, and, and I pulled up this comment because I just, uh, I thought it was so good. And I don't know, it went away, but it said that it's almost like people hate Karen more than they want to hear the truth. And what I see so many people saying is that I hate her smirk. I think she looks cold. I mm -hmm. think she looks mean. I think she gives a meaning to the word Karen. You know, shouldn't her attorneys prep her better that she should look nicer in court and look like she's a nicer person. And like, that's what people are thinking out there. Like she smirks too much. And that's the reason they think she's guilty because she smirks too much. Um, getting on the stand for any defendant is always a risk because you're opening yourself up to cross-examination. <clears throat> and the answer is, I don't know what's going to happen. Um, it's going to depend on how the trial goes. And if her attorneys feel like the jury needs to hear from her and needs to hear her say, I did not do this, and needs for her to explain, you know, the things that they were fighting about and why they were fighting. Oh, no. Do we lose when Melanie? When she was home that night. I mean, if she ran him over and intended to kill him, why would she still be texting him? Right. Why would you, she... You're up and using me. You're up in some other girl. Like. She wouldn't be. It, it make it make sense. When when you're in that courtroom, Melanie, and you have that jury in front of you, <clears throat> and you're, you know, obviously you're a lawyer or, or attorney, can you start to kind of gauge just, you know, I, I don't know if they teach this in law school or anything, how to read a jury. Is there any classes about that, like reading a jury or reading the temperature of a jury? Because I'm sure you can see their body language and their mm -hmm. how they're reacting to certain things. You know, are they making eye contact with you when you're talking about, you know, intri intricate details in, in a case? 
I mean, do you get kind of a feeling, a sense for a jury, or is it just kind of mm -hmm. like you never really know? Well, it's hard as an attorney when you're trying a case to be paying attention to the jury, but there are very sure. highly paid jury consultants that are often hired in big cases. Alec mm. Murdoch had a jury consultant, I believe. Uh, <laughs> there was an entire TV show built around it called Bull with Michael Weatherly that was on CBS. Oh, it was all about a jury consulting firm. That's what they do. They are hired to um, impanel in their office a mirror jury. And then they try the case in front of the mirror jury and or they have the mirror mm. jury watching the case at the same time. And they say, what are you thinking about this? What do you feel about this? How are you? You know, and that. Yeah, my I think Maya also did. They have a jury consultant in that trial as well. I don't remember because I cover so many trials. But as an attorney, you can. It's just hard when you're juggling so many things to be paying attention to the jury. So, yeah, Bull was a great show. I love Michael Weatherly. I, I so, well, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, there are people that do that, that are hired for that specific person purpose. And they're usually psychologists that have uh, a lot of experience in what the jury is going to do or what they're thinking. Mm. I think going back to like, um, I, I think going back to, you know, when people say, oh, you know, you were talking about Karen's body language and the smirking and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. When I get out of it is just complete frustration. Like, I, I, I think she's obviously very frustrated. Um, I think she's actually, you know, in my opinion, she's pissed that she has to sit there and go through this. It's depleted her life for the last two years, her financial. It's put a lot of uh, toll on her family, on her friends, mm -hmm. you know, people that have support her. You know, um, I just sense frustration. Like, it's it's almost like I think she just sits there and goes, I'm literally living in a parallel universe. I can't believe that I'm sitting here right now and having to go through this because it's so obvious. And that's what I mean. I go back to like, all these people that say, oh, no, she's dead guilty. She did something. Can you just wake up out of your slumber for a second and just listen? I mean, it's so obvious what's going on here. I mean, none of the evidence or, or any of the information that's put out there has even supported what the Commonwealth is saying happened in this case. I, that's what I say, too. Every time I do a show, I'm like, show me the evidence that she hit him with his car, with her car. Show me that. He has no injuries below the neck. And Except it's for like the I, arm and the box. Of, like the, it, it, if he was hit by the car, he would have some bruising around the knees, right. around the waist, around the hips, around the thighs. There is none of that. There's and no and evidence. I'll, and I'll go to a car. And I'll go to uh, and I'll 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 talk about coffin naff really quick. She did that uh, hour video on her channel, and I'm like, you just literally put this out, and after your people, <laughs> the FBI confirmed that that John O'Keefe was never struck by Karen Reed's SUV and that Jen McCabe Googled uh, Haas along the die. Like your people did that. Your right. That you stand with. But now they're a bunch of mooks and we shouldn't yeah. pay attention to what they said. Oh, the FBI is not yeah. good enough. Cause when I was on that show with her, she said, Oh, now everyone without a PhD thinks they know that this was caused by a dog. All right. Well, how about this guy has three PhDs and he said a car did not hit John O'Keefe and John O'Keefe was not hit by a car. He's got three, not just one PhD. So do we believe him? He works for the FBI. No, nope. believe him either. I don't, I don't know. Listen, I, I learned a long time ago, young grasshopper, that I am done trying to figure out why people do what they do and why people think what they mm -hmm. think because I'm just mystified every single time. Yeah, I agree. And it was funny because I think you said that she actually tweeted something nice about me, she I think did. like a week or two before that, and then deleted it after I did the, yes. the reaction thing. <laughs> I thought I was imagining it. Did I dream it? Did you guys see that tweet where she said, I remember harken back to the time when I was on Brian LTL's true crime show. He was such a gentleman. He was so kind to me. And she tweeted this whole thing out. And then when you and I spoke and you you said something like, oh my gosh, I just did a thing. Maybe she deleted it. Did you see that? I did not screenshot it. I did not get a receipt, but I saw it out there, Brian. And I was- I had her on. I had her on, oh God, about eight months ago. We talked about the Idaho War case. I thought she actually gave some pretty amazing insight to, to what you know we talked about. And then it was like, I heard what she started saying about this case. And I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> she just lost me now. <laughs> I, thought we were, I thought we were on the same team. Yeah, we thought we were on the same team here, but uh, apparently not. All right, so let's talk about some of the reasons to not take a stand. I think we went over a little bit of this, but the risk of cross-examination would be obviously the most- the most mm -hmm. obvious. So facing cross-examination by the prosecution can uh, be highly stressful and it may lead to damage and mission and inconsistencies. The credibility concerns. If the defendant has a criminal record or other aspects of character that would uh, be exploited by the prosecution, testifying may undermine their credibility. I don't think we have to worry about that in this case. Uh, potential 
a potential for mis misrepresentation, nervousness or confusion on the stand may be construed as guilt by the jury, especially if the defendant struggles to articulate their defense eff uh, effectively. I don't think Karen would struggle in that. I think that she'd be pretty focused she's and, and up there. She's used to speaking yeah. in front of people. She doesn't have fear of public speaking. She's very intelligent. She's very smart. She's well-spoken. But again, the, the people that I see in chat don't like her attitude. And if they don't like her attitude, uh, it's going to, it could be a problem for her, but you know, if it could also help her. So it's going to be a game time decision and it's going to depend mm -hmm. on how the case is going because this case is the trial is supposed to take like six weeks. Yeah. And then we have the strength of the other evidence that the defense has presented strong evidence and the witness uh, so and the witnesses that support their case, the defendant may not to take the stand uh, to bolster the defense. And again, I think you just make a great point about that. You know, it's going to depend on how this case goes. Uh, and, and uh, you know, overall, if Karen would need to take the stand. All yeah. right. So and they're going to be watching the chats. They're going to be <laughs> watching what people are saying to be like, oh, you know, all these people out there in the Maya case, the case they called them bus stop jurors. All the bus stop jurors out there in YouTube land think that, you know, this, that, and the other. Maybe we ought to put, you know, I, it's risky. I don't think it's going to happen, but you never know. Hmm. And then we have another, uh, just concluding on overall strategic concern, uh, considerations, evidence analysis, uh, assess the strength and nature of the evidence against the defendant, uh, and evaluate whether th their testimony is necessary to counter it effectively. The defendant's demeanor, consider the defendant's ability to remain composed and articulate under pressure of cross-examination, as well as their overall demeanor potentially to impact uh, on the jury and the legal consultant rely on the expertise and uh, experienced defense attorneys to weigh in the potential risk of benefit of testifying, taking into account the specific circumstances of the case and the defendant's individual characteristics. I have to say, and I've said this all along, and I say this on my lives all the time. I think that Karen has been blessed with the three greatest attorneys that can handle uh, this case. I mean, I think uh, honestly, well, now we have four. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we do have four. The mix. Yes, but I, I have to say that if this if this goes to trial, which it's looking like it's going to go to trial, I cannot wait <laughs> until Jackson and Unetti get up and have to have Jen McCabe on that stand and all these witnesses. I think, in my opinion, they're going to shred them. I, I absolutely do. Oh, I think without question. I mean, their their <clears throat> their inconsistent statements alone are fodder for cross examination. It's going to be fun. Like, were you lying then, or are you lying now? You know, did you lie the first time you gave the statement, or did you lie the second time you gave the statement, or the third time, or the fourth time, or the fifth time, or did you lie to the grand jury or the federal grand jury? So right. all that testimony is admissible. It's all. So then we have some alternatives to testifying. So character witnesses. Uh, individuals who, def uh, who the defendant will, te will testify, well testify about the defendant's good character, ethics, and applicable peacefulness. This witness can help create a positive image in, of the defendant and suggest that the defendant is not someone who would commit such crime. Would you see something like that in this? Because like we said, you know, they always say that she's she's smirking. She has this bad attitude. Do you think that they would bring in someone like that? In this um, case? They, I think they could bring in people to say how great John and Karen's relationship was mm. and that they, they they weren't fighting. I mean, every couple fights mm. she hadn't. She was in love with him. She wanted to marry him. You know, they could call in people like that. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, she doesn't have any kind of criminal history, so they don't need that. But, you know, if the motive for the Commonwealth is going to be that they were in a fight and she was jealous and that's why she intended to kill him, you know, they could call in witnesses who say, yeah, that, that's not true. Like, right. this is all BS. Right. She didn't kiss Higgins. Like, the, this is all nonsense. So considerations essential to choose witnesses whose credibility is beyond uh, repro uh, reproach and who can uh, communicate effectively with the jury. And then we have expert witnesses. Uh, specialists in various fields, forensic, medical, pathologists, who can provide expert opinions to challenge the prosecution's evidence, uh, offer alternative explanations or questions uh, the reliability of forensic evidence presented, the expert credentials, expertise, and ability to, to explain complex concepts in understanding terms is critical impact uh, for their, of their testimony. I think that's going to be probably one of the biggest things here. Obviously, we have the FBI testimony. Um, but, you know, most cases in, in things like this, 
in modern day uh, cases really uh, rely on those specialists that can come in because we have such technology now and it yeah. just seems like technology is ever so changing every day. Um, and, you know, a big thing now is this guy right here, the phone. I mean, yes, well, somebody about... says in the chat, Mandy says, uh, Mindy said, I messaged, messaged the tweet to LTL. So oh. check and see if you can see that tweet. I'll have to check um, but just a quick note about expert witnesses. Yeah, they're going to, the, the Commonwealth is going to have to have an accident reconstructionist who's going to have to show how this act, this alleged oh. car accident happened. Because right away they said they had video of it happening and now there's no video. They're going to have to have an accident reconstructionist that's going to be able to refute what the right. FBI trained accident reconstructionist says. And that's going to be real interesting testimony. A lot of times I get lost when they have witnesses come in, like in the in the Murdoch trial, talking about, you know, the forensic, like the cellular towers pinging and the, right. and the all of that stuff like is over my head. OK, I'm not that smart. The DNA, like I get lost, I get bored. But the accident reconstruction stuff is going to be really interesting. Yeah, I want to see that. I want to see how the Commonwealth explains it. And then obviously the de defense doesn't have to explain anything. They're just going to be, you know, John walked in the house. <laughs> and this yeah, is how and we know. <laughs> and the expert that's going to tear apart the medical examiner's right. report and the autopsy and say, like, you would never say this in an autopsy report. Right. Um, like, this was not caused by a fight. Why is that even in there? Right. That's going to yeah. be a great cross examination too on the medical examiner. Like, how many times did you take your your test to pass uh, to get your licensure? Um, who was in the room with you while you were doing this mm. this autopsy? Did anyone tell you to put that in there that it, he was not involved? That he, his injuries didn't come from a fight, or he wasn't involved in a fight. Right. Like, yeah. Did someone so coach soft. you through this? Right. Yeah. yeah. And then we have alibi witnesses, individual who can testify to the defendant is elsewhere at the time uh, the crime. Uh, thereby providing an alibi, the reliability and credibility of this witness are crucial as their lack of bias in favor of the defendant. Um, so we'll roll on here a little bit. So more alternatives. So present, presenting physical evidence, including physical evidence that can uh, contradict the prosecution's narrative to support the defendant's uh, version of the events. We actually just kind of talked about that. So uh, and then utilizing technology, a little bit repeat stuff here, leveraging technology tools and reconstruction for si simulations that can provide the jury with visual auditory represent representations of what might have happened, offering an alternative perspective to the prosecution's account. Again, I think that accident, accident reconstruction is going to be the biggest thing here. And then being able to play counteractive off that uh, and then the technology used most reliable in simulations should be based on credible data to avoid challenges from the prosecution. And then motion practice, filing a pretrial and trial motions to exclude or limit harmful evidence uh, challenges prosecutions can legally or constitutionally and set boundaries of what will be presented in uh, the jury. And that's pretty much what's been going on now, correct? No, not yet. The mo those, oh, are, okay. those are called motions in limine and those haven't even happened yet. So I don't know how this trial is happening in three weeks. So they're going to make all these motions in limine to include and exclude certain evidence from the trial. So we've yet to see those. Yeah, successful motions practice can significantly weaken the prosecution's case without the need uh, for the defendant to testify. And then uh, again, motion practices. We just talked about that. Cross examination of prosecution witnesses. We That'll pretty much fun. covered that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then aggressively questioning the prosecution witness to highlight inconsistencies, bias, or inaccuracies in their testimony, therefore undermining the credibility of the evidence against the defendant. And I cannot wait to tune into that if it gets to that level in this case, because uh, that would be very interesting. And then the legal arguments and jury instruction, making compelling closing arguments that will weave together the defense narrative in requesting specific jury instructions that could favor the defendant's case. Uh, the defendant should craft a narrative that result <clears throat> resonates with the jury's perception and values emphasizing reasonable doubt. So now we have to ask team Karen versus the Commonwealth. How do they stack up? What's your opinion, Melody? I, I've kind of said my opinion on uh, all of this. But who's the, who's the better lawyer? Go on. Do we need to do this? Is Marcy going to even step foot in the courtroom? I don't think so. I don't no. think he's coming in to try this case. Right. So it's, it's Mr. Lally. It's Lally. Uh, who's going to be sweating bullets at that point right and 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 uh, i guess ms mclaughlin who's with him against you know you know smooth like butter alan jackson david yanetti who's had his time to shine lately 
uh, Ms. Little, no relation, and uh, Tannis Unity. I think it's this is a no brainer. I think you know, it's um, not a fair fight, but you know, it's Again, all about think, the evidence, right? I, I, I think or lack thereof. The lack thereof, and I and I've said this all along. I think that um, you know, with what the Commonwealth is presenting here uh, to the public saying what Karen Reed has has done in this case, I think it would almost, and I, you know, I've said this at the beginning, it's almost a complete embarrassment uh, that they would bring this forward. Um, to me, in my opinion, I don't think they have a chance at all. There's so much, even, even with the, the cover-up and everything that has gone on, I think when a jury sits in and sees all this, there's so much reasonable doubt there that I, I just don't see a, a jury could, con, could convict. Um, and especially on what second degree murder. Yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. I mean, that she intended to me. kill him. Um, you know, I, some people are out there, some true believers out there who feel like I've hit him is some sort of a confession and they can't understand why a person would say I hit him. They didn't hit him. So that's going to play a large role in here. But then I say, but listen to the source of that information. Mm. Who's saying that she said I hit him? Yeah. Well, you had Kerry <laughs> and Jen and the EMS worker. And that's Do you know that they made a Kerry and Jen made a timeline of events together? Really? A written timeline of events before they testified in front of the grand jury. That came out in the decision on the motion today, which we read on my stream for 24 pages. Uh so Kerry and Jen who the judge says in her decision were friends, which a lot of people in the chat said, no, they weren't friends. Mm -hmm. Harry went to the prom with John O'Keefe, officer John O'Keefe. Mm -hmm. And Jen was his friend for 10 years, but different friend groups, they were not friends with each other. But before they testified before the grand jury in May of 2022, which is several months or April or May of 20, after officer John O'Keefe was killed, three to four months later, they sat down together and wrote a timeline of events before they testified in front of the grand jury. So I can't wait to see that timeline. That's very interesting to me. Hmm. That is very interesting. Why? Why would they do that? Why would they do that? Whose <laughs> idea was that? Uh, why would they do that? And I also found it very interesting the day that uh, Jackson stood up and talked about uh, the confirmation from the FBI that Jen McCabe did Google how yeah. long the die. It's funny that Jen wasn't there in court that day. I that was yes, because maybe throughout one of the one of the many mystery meetings that she had with Lally over the phone or in person <laughs> with no notes and no statements, uh, he said, "Listen, you may not want to show up today." Have you ever heard of anything like this in a case as to what's going on with the the the, the Commonwealth or prosecution talking to all these people on this back and forth? I've never heard of anything like this before. <laughs> like, I mean, it usually doesn't come out, right? There's also usually not an investigation into the investigation, so usually people don't have to testify in front of two different grand juries—a state one and then a year later in front of a federal one. So they got to remember what they said the first time so that it's consistent with what they said the first. So is that what those meetings were about? Like, oh, let's go over your grand jury testimony from the state case. Mm. So can testify. And he's so not allowed up. to prep them for the federal grand jury. They are not his clients. They have attorneys. They've all hired attorneys for the Rule 17 motions for why they didn't want to turn over their cell phones. They had attorneys. And if they didn't mm -hmm. have attorneys, they should have gotten attorneys at that point. And they should have hired attorneys to help prep them for that federal grand jury because Adam Lally is not, that's his name, right? Adam is yeah. not the attorney for Jen McCabe, Brian right. Albert, yeah. uh, you know, Matt McCabe. Higgins. And yeah. that is completely improper. I feel like I'm in the twilight zone when I say this because that is something I've never seen before. That yeah, a district it's... attorney or an ADA would prep witnesses for a federal grand jury? Uh uh, it just is. Isn't that unlawful? That's unlawful, isn't it? Unethical. <laughs> just a little. It's a problem. Oh, Melanie, I don't know. So, are we going to get this moment that the? I'm, I'm going to ask you this because I have, actually haven't asked you this. Are we going to get the moment where the feds come kick in the door and go, "Stop this trial now"? Stop this, this is what everybody's I'm waiting leaving. for. What do you think? My crystal ball is broken. <laughs> At the moment, we can't consult the magic eight In ball. For repairs, yeah, no. oh, where's my magic eight ball? <laughs> what did that magic eight ball used to say? All signs uh, point to yes. All, yeah, point Remember to that one? Yes. All signs point yes. to yes. That's the first thing that came into my head. 
but I don't know. I don't know. There is a reason that the judge is pushing this trial to go ahead quickly. And a lot of people in the chat are saying it's totally going ahead in three weeks. Um, they're still investigating. It's not over. I but they did say, that. in good conscience, we cannot allow this case to go to trial. So why did they say that? Hmm. Why I is the judge pushing this? Why did they not file that egregious misconduct motion where they asked not to file it by the feds who were like, listen, we don't want all that stuff out there right now. Please don't file that motion. Did that motion involve something to do with the judge? Some people have speculated and they didn't want to file it because we saw how she ruled on the recusal motion. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of balls in the air here. A lot of balls in the air. Perry Mason moment, somebody said. Yeah. Um, so we have to still sit here on the edge of our seat like we do every single day. Well, we're not we allowed at the what happens next. We're not allowed at the courthouse, so they're trying to keep us away. Don't wear a t-shirt. Yeah, just don't wear can't read. Or a button that says justice for JJ, by the no. way. Either one of those. And if you're a law enforcement officer and you're going to be sitting in the gallery, no uniforms. They do not want any law enforcement officers who testify to be able to wear their uniforms either. Really? Yeah. This is so crazy. It's crazy, Doesn't crazy. I think crazy. it can't get any weirder. It's like... It just, it just keeps getting weirder. weirder. <laughs> it totally keeps getting weirder. No, and I oh. stay curiouser and curiouser. And so I'm like, call I, me Alice. I fell in this rabbit hole. I think I, I lost all my hair from this case so far. So <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's your hair on the bumper. Yeah, that's my hair on the bumper. I don't know. <laughs> oh my god. All right, Melanie. Listen, I appreciate you doing this, uh, taking the time to come over tonight. I know you had a very, very long stream this afternoon. If you haven't gone over, I'm going to drop Melanie link, Melanie Little's link in the chat. Please go over and subscribe to her. She's wonderful. She's a great attorney, and she's a lot of fun when she comes on the show. I love uh, all our little backroom chats too. <laughs> like, did you see this? Did you see this? And uh, it's it's been really great, and it's been an honor to get to know you and and uh, you know start this kind of friendship that we've had here and I, and I appreciate you coming over here and doing this but that is Melanie Little go over and check out her channel um I don't know we'll have to do this again sometime in a couple of weeks once we start getting towards the trial and see what happens yeah craziness in Canton a craziness right or it's Dedham Crazy. actually yeah craziness in Canton. All right, we're going to head out of here. Thank you everybody tonight for tuning in. I appreciate it. Please make sure to smash the like button on the way out. Leave a comment down below. Do you think that Karen Reed will need to take the stand if this goes to trial? Be curious to see uh, what you think. Make sure to subscribe and again, give this video a thumbs up. It keeps it moving in the algorithm. I'm Brian. This is LTL True Crime. That's Melanie Little. Go over and check out her YouTube channel. We appreciate you all. I'm going to hit the outro. Have a good night, everybody. Bye bye. Getting into my mouth, the wicked no alibi. No alibi. It's the true crime. Unraveling the web of evil. No stone left unturned. We dive into the crime. Yeah, we digging up the dirt. Bringing justice to the crime. LTL true crime. Unveiling dark realities of the true crime. Unraveling the web of evil. No stone left unturned.